Thanks, Michael. You heard it, a Palm Pilot. This is the Heine Pilot. Uh, you put it in your back, pat, right in, there it is. All right, well, um, Charlie and I are here to talk to you about a piece of the book that uh, we're developing for Big Picture and Beyond. And uh, we had a call this morning with Andrew and this guy, Tim Gals, who works for Barclay, which is a very large advertising agency, and he's giving us his time for free to try to get this message out. So this is going to be more of a workshop after I do a little bit of uh, talking. So um, there's going to be, a, there's always a lot being discussed around agency. And we've been involved with agency with Jerome Bruner. And we look at it very, very differently. And a whole, Seymour Saris and a whole host of other people. And, and there's always been a lot of talk lately about student engagement, but it's engaging students around the content. Like, you know, oh, you got to be a clown or something like that. So you engage students as a teacher, you know, get their attention. Oh, but never starting with the student. And then there's a lot of talk around student-centered. But student-centered also is kind of a misnomer, and everybody uses it because it's not starting with where the student is at. And when you were at the schools today, you saw student-centered starting with where the student is at, and student engagement starting with where the student is at. And agency is not done just in your head alone. Agency is done in a community where you are responsible for your actions in a community where you have advisors and mentors around you. So there's a triangulation that we've always thought about and worked on. And that's just a, a prelude to this, to say that all that stuff, when you listen to a guy like Dick Murnane talk, when you listen to Sal Khan talk, they always start with a narrative my nephews weren't good in math, so I invented the Khan Academy. But they start at the school door instead of starting with that relationship that Sal Khan had with his nephews. Not bad, but not, not as exactly right. Or Dick Murnane saying, oh, in his last piece, he's an auto mechanic, a, a student who loves automobiles. And he's been playing with them for years. And where does the story start? When he's exhausted all the stuff outside, and now he wants to take some courses. But he already did all that work around his interests. Not just somebody who's sticking in an automotive class and pray that they like it. That's real, real different. So think of that as blind spots, and that's one of the themes. So I'll just show you something about a blind spot. You don't have spot. to look, pal. All right. You just play them and I'll name them. All right. Brush up on the songs. Now let's not waste any time. Get going. All right. <laughs> Will you wait a minute, please? Why must you always play da 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 before you go in and play the song I'm trying to get? If I told you once, I told you a hundred times. It's the only way I can warm up before I play the piano. A pitcher warms up before he pitches a ball game? I gotta warm up that way before I play the piano. I hope I don't have to tell you this again. Are you ready? Go ahead and play. Shuffle off the Buffalo, written by Warren and Dubin for a little picture called 42nd Street. The year was 1932. <laughs> All right, Mr. Cramden, I wish you a lot of luck. And here's your first question for $100. Are you ready? I certainly am. All right, Mr. Cramden, for $100, who is the composer of Swanee River? River. That's right, Swanee River. Can we have a few bars of Swanee River, Jose? <laughs> That's Swanee River. That's right. Now, who's the composer? Your time's running out. Hurry up. You better take a guess. Hum and hum and hum and hum and hum and hum and hum
Ed Norton. <laughs> oh, I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Cramden. No, the correct answer is Stephen Foster. But thanks so much. You've been a wonderful contestant and a swell sport. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Cramden. So uh, I was talking about blind spots to Charlie one day, and he said, the honeymooners, that, that video. And we would contend that Almost the entire education system is blind to starting with students' interests around student engagement and centering students around starting with them and who they are first, what their interests are, who they know, what's in their communities, what are those assets. So we put together a list of expectations that we're trying to take out. And they're in the book. And there's, there's books here for people who don't have them. We're going to show you a little animation that uh, was co-created by Rachel, myself, Charlie, and one of our students, Gianna. I hear a lot lately that schools have high expectations of students. And who's not for high expectations? But what about the expectations that students have of our schools? These get much less attention, but they are essential to keeping us in school and deeply engaged in our learning. Just what are these student expectations? I see 10. Relationships. Am I just another face in the crowded classroom, a test score? Or do my teachers know about me and my interests and talents? Do they help me to form relationships with adults and peers who might serve as models, mentors, and coaches? Relevance. Is it just a series of hoops to jump? Or is the work relevant to my interests? Do my teachers help me to understand how my learning contributes to my community and to the world? Time. Am I expected to learn at a constant pace decided by the teacher? Or can I learn at my own pace? Is there time for my learning to be deep as well as broad? Timing. Do all students have to learn things in the same sequence? Or can I learn things in the order that fits my learning style or interest? Play. Is there always pressure to perform? Or do I have opportunities to explore and make mistakes and learn from them without being branded as a failure? Do I have opportunities to tinker and make guesses? Practice. Do we learn something and then immediately move on to the next skill? Or can we engage in deep and sustained practice of those skills we need to learn? Choice. Am I just following the same path as every student or, do I have real choices about what, when, and how I will learn and demonstrate my abilities? Authenticity. Is my work just a series of dittos? Or, is the learning and work I do regarded as significant outside of school by experts, family, and employers? Does the community recognize the value of my work? Challenge. Is it just about completing assignments? Or, do I feel appropriately challenged? Am I addressing high and meaningful standards of excellence? Application. Is my learning all theoretical? Or do I have opportunities to apply what I'm learning in real world settings? So there you have it. 10 expectations that should have equal billing with the school's expectations of students. I think of these expectations as imperatives, must haves for every learner. I'd like to tweet these imperatives to every teacher in America and post them on every school's webpage. I'd like to propose that schools evaluate themselves not just by their students' test scores, but also by students' judgments about how well the schools deliver on these imperatives. What do you think? Go to leavingtolearn.org to learn more about the imperatives and to share your thoughts. Okay, well, that's on... Um, YouTube, and it's got about 38,000 hits on it. Not nearly enough, but all right, not bad. And we produced one for parents, one for students, and one for teachers and adults. So who are just working with students, be they at a museum, or at a youth organization, or whatever those places are on the outside. So Charlie's going to take it from here and run you through these activities. And we're kind of using you, in some sense, as a focus group or as a way to think about how to go, how to use these in the best possible way as an app. Okay, okay. Charlie, go ahead. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to stand over here so I'm as tall as Elliot. <laughs> I'm 
standing on this. But if I stand down here, see, it's a whole different experience, isn't it? <laughs> OK. Uh, when you went to the schools this morning, you took in your head at least the 10 distinguishers of a big picture school. And as you went around the school, you looked for exhibitions, you look for real world learning, you look for projects, and so on. And we're all familiar with that. Obviously, when Elliot and I wrote the book, that's what we based it on, everything we learned in big picture schools. But as the book evolved, and as it's evolved even since the book, we've discovered that these expectations are even a bit more fundamental. That they're really what drove big picture design. That coming up with we need real world learning, we need authentic projects, authentic assessment, really is based on this, which is just a little bit deeper, if you will. And one of the nice things about this is it can apply to any learning on the planet. And so what evolved in our thinking was the thought that these really become a kind of student bill of rights. If you're going to teach me how to learn, <clears throat> you won't get these. So think about the equation that we're using right now. If you want deep and sustained learning, deep and productive learning, as we call it in the book, you're going to need to have students who are deeply engaged over a sustained period of time. In order to get that, you're going to have to motivate the students to show up, period, to even pay attention to you. And our argument in the book, and certainly getting firmer now, is that in order to get them to pay attention to you, you've got to pay attention to them. And we think implicitly, if not explicitly, these are what young people want of schools. And so we're beginning to think of this as a, <coughs> excuse me, as a kind of Swiss army knife, as a multiple tool, tool, <laughs> for getting at the fundamental redesign of schools, if not learning. And so we began to think, just brainstorming one day, what could you do with this tool? What could you do with these expectations? And we said, well, one would be just the one I described. Imagine going into a school with this, ten, this list of 10 expectations and seeing whether that school delivers on them. Do they provide choice? Do they provide time for practice? Will they allow timing to be moved around? Well, you see how I can see by your nod, you're saying, whoa, this is an audit I'd like to do, <laughs> right? Because we know we'd find lots of schools that might not be doing that well on these. And so we began to generate a number of ideas about how we could use it. And we don't have much time with you today, so we thought we'd share a short list, our short list of ways of using them kind of get you to think about two questions. And I'll see if I can find those. OK. OK, thank you, Elliot. So I'll just run through these very quickly. And we'll keep these up there, because I'm going to ask you and your tables just to do some talking about them. So we said, yeah, we could infuse the expectations into the day-to-day -day work of the school. Imagine if teachers, all the time as they were designing their school, were constantly keeping those 10 expectations as kind of like design requirements. How are we doing? Are we meeting that requirement? Are we meeting that one? What are we doing to increase choice, et cetera, et cetera? And again, you can think beyond big picture schools, can't you? Because you take these into almost any school with which you work. Using the expectations, this is a bit of a stretch, as student competencies. Think for a moment about how much attention we're sp spending on social-emotional learning and the competencies. Some of these crosswalk into those quite naturally. But imagine asking a student, how competent are you in building relationships outside of school with adults who are doing the work you want to do? And you can take and turn each one of the 10, not just as an expectation the student has of school, but of an expectation that student might have of herself or the school and the teacher might have of the student. And then you can begin to think about how you deliberately design instruction so kids got better in each of these competencies if we thought about them. So that's a second use. A third, aligning it with the non-cognitors. And that's a little bit of duplication. But the social-emotional thing, which we're all struggling with, this might be another way in, another way to think about those. Uh, student recruitment. 
Imagine going out in, in, into the middle schools uh, or even late elementary schools and saying, kids, this is the learning we deliver. How many kids would sign up if you approach them by saying, these are the expectations. We think this is what you want for learning. This is what we deliver. Come see our school. Okay, so another one. Orienting new teachers. Imagine bringing, I heard someone talking about how do we bring new teachers into the process. Could this be a tool we use? One of many, but it could be a tool we use to start talking to teachers about the different kind of learning experience we'd like to provide in our schools. And finally, using it with parents. I've actually begun developing some instruments that parents can use to talk to their teacher about the expectations. So you can begin to think about the number of ways that we could use these in our schools. Now this is just six. These are just a quick brainstorm from uh, the two of us just thinking about what we might do with them. And we have two questions for you. And we're going to give you, kind of respecting the time, we want to get a little data, and then we're going to come back and throw it open to your conversation. But we'd like at your tables, if you could take about 10 minutes and address these two questions. What other uses can you think of beyond the six? That would really be helpful to us, and then eventually to all of us. We'll explain that later. If you could think about something beyond the six that in our quick brainstorm we completely missed. We'd really like to hear about that. And then, which of these would you most value in advancing your own work? So each of you comes from a setting that's kind of unique. So we're hoping if you address that second question, we'll come up with a wide variety of ideas about how you'd use these or others in advancing the work you're trying to do uh, in your own school or with other schools. Some of you here work with lots of other schools as well. Okay, if I gave you about uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes at your table, so you think you could address those? Any questions about the assignment, if you will? Well, I'd, I'd leave up the six, just in just case. Leave I'd leave okay. up the six, because that way you'll say, oh no, we've got that one already, or we don't have that one already. Okay, want to give it a try, Michael? Question? I think I've answered it. Number two, which of the uses would you value the most, right? Not which of the expectations. Right, which of these uses, which of these six or anything else you come up with would you value most? And we'd be interested in hearing why. Okay? Let's start with 10 minutes. I'll check back. Go. Okay. Could we, could we co come back together? See what you've come up with? Thank you. Thank you. Now, in talking with Elliot, just briefly, his guess, and we've got a side bet, Elliot and I, his bet is that there won't be another one other than the six. He's, so, so it's up to you to prove him wrong on this, right? So let's start with the first question. Brian's videotaping this, so we've got every, all the data is going to be on tape. But let's start with the first question. Uh, could it be that Elliot is wrong? Could it be that there's a seventh or, no way. A, or an eighth? <laughs> okay, who's, who's got a suggestion? Yes, sir. Using the expectations of mentors. Ah, no. <laughs> that's great. Thank you. I won the bet. No, this is great. I, I feel good. I can, I can buy dinner tonight. Okay. <laughs> the mic? Yeah. He lost it. Okay. So we've got, we've got a seventh already. How about an eighth? Way in the back? Could you repeat what that was? Using it with mentors. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry. Another. Come on, we've got an eighth unit. Um, using... Oh, we got a hand out the mic. I can run it around. Oh. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Eunice is set. Uh, We wanted to add, um, you have using the expectations uh, in orient orienting new teachers. We said just in professional development of all teachers. Okay, just using all it right. Well, that's, we're going to give that like 6A. You know, okay. <laughs> but it's, it's a good one. I mean, we need to think about the entire faculty, not just the new students. Okay. Yes, Lisa, Nancy. Oh. Nancy? Oh. Oh, sorry. Might be 4A. Um, so thinking about 
we're constantly recruiting middle school students, so we have to educate the guidance counselors so they understand mm -hmm. our model, and this could be a way to get them to understand the model so they can encourage their students to come. Okay, thank you. And right behind you? <laughs> we thought of the marketing or the selling of your school to potential partners of the school. Okay, okay. Uh, we were also discussing this use of this as a framework for curriculum design. So the way that kids or, and teachers approach designing units, curriculum mapping, project design, um, there's lots of possibilities for planning. Okay, very cool, thank you. And there's one way in the back. Oh, no. Oh. Michael, you control the mic. Right. So you... On the same line as professional development, we talked about using it or somehow developing a teacher survey to kind of benchmark where they are um, to give to the kids so that they could get feedback from the kids as to how they are doing with the 10 in their advisory or their classes. Okay, okay, very good, very helpful, thank you. I thought about it as um, an exhibition agenda outline that students needed to present where they are in each of those 10. Yeah, interesting, thank you. Is there another one at the table? Yes, thank you. And, and relatedly, um, my son who graduated last year from the Met said in his valedictory speech that, he, he, and I'm paraphrasing, equivalent of you know the happiest he was at the Met was when he was taking advantage of all the opportunities he had. And so he was unhappy when he wasn't doing all these things that were, in, that were intrinsic in the design. And so maybe also a way for students to be very like kind of meta about what they're doing and why they're doing it. And that these are signals of happiness for many people. And, um, and then also a way for them to coach each other as well. Um, because the kids coach each other about getting out of the building and going to find an internship and going to get their resources. And so we could teach them the language of passion. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, we came up with two. The first one oh, was no. just one. Oh, just person. one? Okay, good. Um, <laughs> Take, taking a, um, a leaf from Danielson's rubric, uh, making a rubric for school evaluation, principal evaluation. Or you can do the second. Oh, and the, se the second one was um, in uh, teacher uh, in college when in the teacher prep programs, um, exposing this to them very young at you know when they're newbies. Okay, thank you. I'm glad I allowed you to do that second one. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to do two as well. So. I can do three, no. Uh, the first is using this as a filter uh, on uh, digital learning transitions. Uh, so how do these like one-to-one -one deployments actually meet these goals? And the, the second was using this as a filter on the development of uh, student assessments and accountability systems for schools. <laughs> Could I ask a question, You're very yeah. selfishly, on your first one, mm -hmm. are you saying that we could use this as a kind of an evaluation tool for the technology applications? Yeah, actually, okay. I think we need to, because okay. right now what we're getting is a lot of just people trading textbooks for tablets okay. Thank and, you. and losing the opportunity to do these things in, uh, during that transition. Cool. We've got that on tape. <laughs> okay, one, one more. Yeah. If we've got one more, then we'll get to question two. I thought it would be good to introduce these concepts to the media because they are frequently looking at our schools and judging them on a test score, but if they had a broader lens to look at the different aspects of what makes a school a quality school, yeah. and they may be able to see it, maybe not all 10, but maybe some schools wouldn't be labeled as a failure because they're working on or meeting needs in other areas. Right, very good, okay, thank you. Uh, let's, let's go to question two, uh, and, and this asked, which one and would you value most in your school, would be, in a sense, would help you the most advance what you're trying to do in your school, advance your school design and so on. Uh, did you have enough time to think about uh, some ideas about this one? We're looking for, Jeff, yeah? Just consolidating a few from our table. Uh, there seem to be a lot of interest in assessment tools or reflective tools for school assessment and for working with teachers. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Others? Couldn't pick a favorite. Huh? Seeing if Andrew's here, she. <laughs> she has a good idea. Well, that the skims question. the question. Go ahead. Who wants it? Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm a part of Tanisha's advisory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what the the suggestion was that instead of just asking kids about the we have bees, so this honeycomb is kind of throwing me, but um, about the, the elements that um, you would give kids $100 and then ask them to pay for the parts that were most important to them. Yeah. So then you get kids really thinking about what is important, not just saying, oh, I think this, or I think that, I think the other. Yeah. Yeah. You have to put your money where your mouth is and you really think about, and kids are really good at deciding how they're gonna spend their money. Yeah, yeah, excellent, thank you. Good way of thinking, nice thinking tool there. As well, yeah. Yay. 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 Anyone else with uh, an observation about how it might be valuable in your school, how you might use it? Which one? He, I, he's, give him the mic, Mike. He, he needs the mic. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's nothing new that's not on there, but the, the idea of using it and student recruitment is, some, is a project that I came into this conference with, and it just really resonated with me. Okay. And the idea that this is, these expectations are what the student should expect of us, and the school could expect it of the student, and then, as you said, the student should expect it of themselves. Yeah. And so I'm just really fired up to like start the proposal right now of how to sort of work it into the recruiting. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, we're going to throw it open, and Elliot might have a few comments as well, but what we really did here was just start a conversation and kind of selfishly, uh, at least initially, this was helpful to us in fleshing this out. We're really trying to play with this a little bit to see whether there are some practical tools and maybe some practical ways of applying these tools that would not only advance the big picture design, but get us, as was said earlier, to influence people outside our network to think more deeply about what they're doing. You know, they might, they might be a little reticent to say, oh, I, I, uh, I can't do the real world learning the way you people do it because that's two days a week outside of school. But if you can get them to think about authenticity one step back and then have them design from that, you may capture them and then eventually bring them to a day or two outside. So they may evolve to a big picture design even though they don't stop there. This may be a way to stop that conversation with others at an easier place, a place that they'll buy into. That's, that's our thought. But we intend, as I said, Brian's taping this. We have the audio. We're going to get the transcript. And you're going to hear about this in the future because we're going to share with you what we're learning and we're going to ask you to share with us what you are learning as you use either some tools we're thinking of or just some ways of thinking about advancing our work. So that's, that's where we're going next with this. Uh, Elliot, a few questions or observations and then we still have some time for questions. And, and From, oh, quite, yeah, and we have time if you want to do the video mm -hmm. and, and another activity. We've got about 20 minutes. Oh, we have 20 minutes? Yeah. Let's, sh yeah. let's show the video. Let's show them. Oh, yeah, you want to add more? Yeah. Oh. Well, this is building on what Garth said. It, it reminded me that at our school, the, I think the entry or unentry for us into getting really deep with the MCVs was starting to use them as a lens for student interventions. So if a student was mm -hmm. falling apart, looking at the, the MCVs to say, well, you know, what's not working here? It seems like this might be mm -hmm. a similar way to yes. approach those. Yeah. yeah, good idea, good idea. Okay. Anybody else? Let's show the video. Let's yeah. show, show so the we'll, do, we'll do, and, and thanks everybody, those are, those are really great. Yeah. Uh, sure. It shows that there's a lot that can be gotten from a little. And, uh, and so this, oh, this, oh, this video um, is a video that's on it, the Edutopia site that was done uh, by a friend of ours, Steve Brown, who's uh, really brought to us uh, a la Enrique. Uh, and he did a documentary this past fall called Is School Enough uh, about outside of school learning, which uh, we had a 
bit of a role in. He also did this uh, video of uh, one of, uh, uh, of a student from the San Diego Met. So if you take a look at this video, and uh, Mildred certainly knows this student, Noah, and, and could, but we, we're not, afterwards we'll ask Mildred to maybe say a few words about Noah. Maybe not, because I saw that look, it's all right. <laughs> but uh, take a look at the video, and then we'll throw the honeycomb up. And then we'll have a conversation about whether or not you see Noah fulfilling these 10 expectations. Yes. In fact, take out a piece of paper, and as you watch the video, the see how collected. many of the expectations you find in it. Yes, just that's a, what I mean. just a quick note, yeah. and then we'll then we'll see. You can test yourself oh, oh. against them. Here, I'm able to do things that affect how San Diegans think about water, and I'm able to do something where I can put my mark on the world that I will soon be coming into. I'm Noah, 16, and I go to the San Diego Met High School, which is a school where students start participating in an internship program beginning in the first semester of ninth grade. Coast Keeper, their mission statement is to have drinkable, swimmable, and fishable waters in San Diego. Basically, we want more fish in our rivers, we want our rivers to be cleaner, and we want them to be less filled with trash. That's fun. That looks pretty good. The internship program is a great way for students to find new opportunities, to do things that they might not do during the normal school day. Meet people who they wouldn't meet, have experiences, get training, get trained to do things. Yeah. Basically just, here's how you need to get your foot in the door. When Elliot Washer and myself had the opportunity to create a new school, we really closed our eyes and said, if we didn't know there was such a thing as school, what would it be like? And it wouldn't be the 50 minute classes and you ring a bell and you run to some other place. That's not how learning is. If we have low oxygen, high mm -hmm. bacteria, then there's really something in the water that we need yeah. to figure out. What's the worst bacteria that we have here in San Diego? Tier one, no question. No question, yeah. And so we set out that every kid was gonna have their individual learning plan. What are your skills? What are your interests? Then we send them out in the community where the real world's there. And they work two days a week from ninth grade on. So instead of going from school to work, we really go from work to school. What are the real academics in the real world that are really being used? And then use that as a motivator to get kids more engaged in school. That's a good job. One more to filter? Yep. Having Noah working alongside me is, I think, both really valuable for Noah and really valuable for me. For Noah, he gets really an insider's look at what it's like to have a career. Today we went to the San Diego River and we collected some water samples. First thing we did is we collected a unfiltered water sample that we're going to bring back to the lab and run bacteria analysis on it. And so that's how we measure if the water is safe to swim in. We also took a second sample where we filtered it, which was what we did with the pump. Uh, that filtered water is going to be used to measure nutrients and dissolve metals in the water. So it's a high salinity. Which is interesting because we had a rain recently. Yeah. So rain, you would expect. Yeah, wash out all the salt. Uh, He's shown me how to do these things that I had no idea to do. He's taught me how to sample. He's basically taught me how to use Excel and all the advanced formulas. That's perfect. You see how when it dips down? Yeah. Like that, and that dip is right on the line? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's perfect. There you go. 
Noah has the same job I had when I was 23 years old and finishing school. He does data entry, he does quality control checks. I really rely on him at this point. You know, he's 16 years old and I, can, I could not do the job that I do now without him. Ready? Yeah, let's go. Getting off campus lets me be able to do things and see things that I would never be able to see except for like career day on campus. When he graduates high school, he's gonna have three years, maybe four years of work experience in a lab. And I think it's really gonna set him ahead. When he's in college applying for jobs, he's got that extra bump of, of work experience, of relevant work experience. To have an idea of what to expect before starting your first job, seeing people work, it helps you know the environment and know where you're going. That's what's really great about this. Okay. Hope you liked it. Now, I don't know how to do it. I know, like I never do anything more than once. So, so Mildred's going to come up. I do it this way, say a few things about Noah, and then let's hear if in the video you saw. Most of you know Elliot always bossed me around and he never tells me he's getting ready to do this. I didn't know. Okay, but Noah is a senior, and I wanna piggyback on something that Nance and I were talking about at Tim School, that if you're looking for rigor and relevance, LTI projects, and I think when we were looking at Noah and this presentation, we could see the empirical reasoning embedded in this. We could see the quantitative reasoning embedded in this. The other thing that I really saw is his confidence. Uh, he enjoyed his work. Uh, this is a big organization in San Diego, and to do this water quality study, it was gonna cost them $10,000. And Noah said, I can do it for 1,000. And they gave him the challenge, and he came in under budget. So it's all about the passions of the students, it's about the relevancy, and it's about the rigor. And LTI projects is an awesome way to allow children to do quote unquote rigor based on common core standards. And I'm happy to see that many of us in this room, we can see that piece embedded in this. Uh, he is a senior, and he has indicated that when he comes home on the holidays, that he will be helping Elliot and I open a brand new med school uh, in San Diego on an existing campus, and I think we need as many students as possible. But this young man came to the Met brilliant. Internships, exhibitions, and college classes, he will be graduating with enough college credits to have an AA degree. So he's just a gifted young man. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mildred. All right, so now let's hear from people about what they saw in that video around 10 student expectations. Go ahead. Relate. OK. Authenticity, yeah, absolutely real work. OK, real work, real relationships. What do you mean? Say what you mean a little bit about it. Right, okay, thank you. Yeah, Vince? I actually know Travis. I went to UC Davis with him. Really? <laughs> That's the mentor. The mentor. <laughs> right. <laughs> not the student, not at all. That's right. That's right. So that relationship is building social capital. It's probably going to be lifelong, yeah. career-wise. Yeah? So you have a challenge. Uh, Mildred brought that up. Uh, he said, I can do it for $1,000. So he took that challenge, and he came in on the foot. That's right. That's right. OK. Very good. Yeah? Dennis? Relevance. Lots of real-world application problems all 
Right, okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah? Mario? Okay, thank you.